until this year, the, the solder chants have received a lot of attention you know, in the university and outside of the university. How well do you think the university has responded to those chants? Well, we're still in the process of responding. Uh, so there were the initial uh, responses, which had to do mostly with trying to send the signal clearly that the university didn't really believe, and I didn't really believe, that those chants represented our values as an institution or even the values of the vast majority of students. So there were those initial responses, you know, people left their uh, positions. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of discussion, I know, within the Sauter School. Beyond that, though, I uh, asked for a uh, working group to be created, a task force, uh, to look at the whole question of the sexualization of violence and the trivialization of Aboriginal identity, which, as you know, is, is a part of our broader culture, not just an issue at UBC. So they've reported back. Uh, their initial uh, draft suggestions have uh, now gone out for consultation very broadly. Uh, so I encourage people to look at the UBC website if they want to uh, participate in that consultation. When I hear back from uh, the task force and they report on what they heard from the consultation, then there will be further, act, uh, further decisions taken about how we move forward to try to address the fundamental questions, not just the superficial element of the chant. Mm -hmm. And overall, what sort of effects do you think these chants have had on the university's reputation? Uh, I, you know, universities are here for the long term, and uh, I must say that uh, I haven't heard very much discussion about them after the first few weeks. That isn't to say that we shouldn't treat it seriously and that there aren't fundamental issues that we want to uh, address, but I don't think it has a particularly strong implication for the reputation of UBC. We still had, you know, more people than ever applying to come here. We're not having any trouble attracting uh, professors, so people vote with their feet. I don't think it's it's uh, a fundamental issue. What's the current state of, of security on campus? I know in, in, after the assault police presence was increased, you know, more campus security yes. patrols. How long should those increased patrols go on? You know, when is campus going to be back to normal? Yeah, well, we made a decision that we would keep them on for the course of this academic year. Uh, there was some speculation that perhaps we should reduce uh, patrols after Christmas, etc. We decided not to do that because we wanted to make sure that people felt that we were treating the security issue as seriously as we should. Uh, and <laughs> there's also a task force that's been created to look at security on campus. It's also uh, reported back. Again, I encourage people uh, to go online and to uh, contribute to that dialogue. There are a whole series of questions that have been presented about, for example, whether we should uh, have cameras on campus, to what extent we should do that. I mean, we have some, but should we enhance that? Uh, how should we uh, choose to spend money uh, on security? Is it better to have more people, uh, actual people patrolling? Uh, do we have to enhance the services for safe walk? Whole series of things. Having said that, it's really important to remember that this is one of the safest campuses in North America. Yes, we had a terrible set of events uh, which seems to have been perpetrated by one person, uh, but if you look at the overall statistics, this remains a very safe campus. So we want to make sure that we don't overreact. We want to make sure that we don't transform the spirit of the campus by overreacting and over-securitizing. At the same time, we want people to feel safe. So we'll get the report back from that working group, and we'll make some concrete decisions going forward. I know cameras are, you mentioned them already, cameras are mentioned in that report. What kind of place do you think cameras should have on university campus in terms of privacy concerns? Well, I, that's exactly the right set of questions. I think if you look at the report, it's very carefully balanced. It, it shows that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that cameras alone do not necessarily uh, reduce crime. On the other hand, it is true that cameras, if they're uh, placed properly, can sometimes help in uh, finding people after crimes have been committed. The biggest question in terms of security overall, though, is how is the community itself functioning? Is it a community that looks out one for another? Do people make sure that they're, uh, you know, walking together uh, late at night? So it's really about, in a sense, community spirit. That's the single most important determinant of security and safety on a campus. So I think that actually what we really need to focus on is how to make this community strong and as vital as possible so that we look after one another. Okay. So today the sports review results were announced and you mentioned you thought this review could bring 
part uh, bring about a sort of renaissance of, of sports at UBC. You know, yes. Been a lack of attendance at games. Do you, do you think this review is going to change change the campus culture and sports and, and how? Uh, not in and of itself, uh, but I think it can contribute to it. Uh, the one piece uh, that I'm very excited about is the uh, a level of alumni engagement. Now you could say, well, there were a lot of people who were complaining and unhappy about the review. On the other hand, a lot of people stepped up to the plate, to use a sports analogy, and actually uh, made contributions and started to self-organize. So I think that alumni engagement is going to be dramatically increased. And I think that has the potential, if we use our resources correctly, to start having a spillover effect back onto the campus itself and students. So one of the enhancements that we have said we're going to provide to um, the teams that are really pursuing excellence is marketing help. And I think if we do that well, working with student government, working with uh, residents' uh, life, I actually think that we could change the culture a little bit. Look, we're never going to be uh, the University of Michigan uh, with 180,000 people at football games. It's not part of Canadian culture. That's not just about universities. On the other hand, there's a lot of great sport that's done on campus, and I'd love to see more people experiencing that, both as players, as participants, and that's part of the review process, but also as uh, excited spectators. So uh, earlier this week, you know, Gregor Robertson said that the Broadway line to UBC is a matter of national importance. Yes. Um, do, you, do you agree with that? And what role should UBC take in terms of rapid transit? Uh, well, I, uh, it's a strong term, uh, but I actually agree. And, and the reason that he said that is because it came directly out of some joint work that UBC sponsored with the city. There was a report done by uh, KPMG that talked about the economic and social benefit of the Broadway corridor and talked about how important it is to link together, for example, all of our medical facilities, uh, which are you know, over at VGH and, and all around that site, uh, with all of the high tech and uh, startup companies that are along the Broadway corridor with the university where a lot of this actually begins. So connecting that research endeavor into uh, the broader community is quite fundamentally important and not just for Vancouver but as he said really for the whole country. We've got to create these hubs of innovation that are always centered around universities and one of the things that we learned uh, when we did the study is that those kinds of hubs of innovation only work if you've got good connectivity and right now we don't have great connectivity. So UBC I'm sure working with our students is going to keep pushing over the next few years uh, to ensure that that uh, mass uh, transit facility is built. And do you think it's UBC's place to help finance that? Well, it, that's a really tough question. We've been really clear, the Board of Governors has been really clear that we cannot use resources that we have been given to uh, educate uh, students and conduct research and directly uh, transfer that uh, to uh, pay for public transit. So we're not in the same position as the airport, which was able, of course, to charge fees in order to uh, make the contribution that it made. On the other hand, we do have some resources uh, that are uh, somewhat unusual for a university, such as our land base. So maybe there's a possibility, certainly, of using gifting the land where, for example, a transit hub might be uh, to the transit authority as part of a contribution. Uh, there may be other ways that we can find resources that are not coming out of our operating budget uh, to support uh, rapid transit. Uh, the board's considering all of that. It has made no decision. I want to be clear about that. But I suspect over the course of the next few months, if this really does move forward, the board will be put in a position where it will have to decide what resources uh, UBC wants to bring to bear. So we're just going back to the university's budget. The provincial grants have you know, been decreasing and you know, it's putting a strain on the university's yes. budget. What areas should the university prioritize as you know, the flow of money to spend decreases? So we're in the midst now of what's called a core review, which is being mandated by the province. And one of the things that's quite interesting about that is an opportunity for self-reflection. Uh, I want to be clear, the core review is not designed to find uh, cuts. And we've been told that expressly by the province. So that's not how we're approaching it. But as you suggested in your question, we always, as a huge institution, have to be setting priorities. So I think
think we will over the course of the next few years, as budgets remain, I suspect, quite tight, have to, through internal processes, think through, you know, where are we best able to make a difference in the world? Now, some of that means uh, there may be some programs that uh, really won't make as much sense going forward because they are not attracting a lot of students to the program, and we'll have to think about that. It also may mean uh, research activities that are not actually at the forefront of, uh, of human knowledge that aren't really contributing as strongly as we should expect a UBC research program to contribute. We may have to think about uh, you know, tailoring uh, support, limiting it, and concentrating resources. I can't pretend to know exactly where that's going to be, and it's not going to be my role to do it, but I do suspect that over the next few years, some of those choices will have to be made. The other side of the equation, though, is we're not going to be able to rely on provincial resources increasing in the way that they had, you know, in the 1970s, 80s, etc. So, we have to look at alternative revenue sources for the university as a whole, and we're doing that. We're looking, for example, at the summer use of campus. How could we be more efficient with this incredible facility we have that's you know half empty during the summer? Uh, same thing for the Okanagan campus, uh, where we I think we'll have to look at summer use of campus. We're going to have to look at whether or not we're doing the very best we can in professional education uh, after graduation. Could we could we actually see that as a source uh, of of uh, strength for our alumni and as a potential revenue source. So we're going to have to look at a whole series of things uh, as uh, federal and provincial funding remains constricted and yet costs continue to rise, what are alternative ways we can finance? So a Bandit College will be, be opening next year. Um, how, how will the students in Bandit College fit in with the rest of the university? Because it is se separate to a certain extent, but yeah. there is sort of this idea of them being a part as well. Yeah, it's a really important question because it would be a disaster, in my view, if we brought a whole bunch of people onto campus, put them into some kind of isolation chamber, and didn't allow them to really be part of the whole student experience. So we're still questioning whether all of the Vantage College students should be housed in one uh, of the new uh, facilities, or whether or not we might want to spread some out and, and perhaps test that. Uh, there are advantages in both ways. You can imagine it's easier to provide enhanced supports if people are located in one place. On the other hand, it may very well be that it's harder for them to improve uh, their integration and their language skills if they are put into a kind of cocoon. So I would suspect for the first couple of years we have to be doing some testing and some piloting uh, to really learn what seems to work best. What I do know is for all of those students, uh, they're going to have to have proper supports and we're going to have to be quite intentional about how we help them integrate. One of the things I'm excited about is apart from Vantage College, the new facility that we'll be creating in the, in the renewed sub over the course of the next few years is going to have a very large component dedicated towards international students and facilities there way uh, beyond what we can now provide in iHouse. So, you know, I think there are a whole series of things that we need to do to make sure that those students feel welcome and that they can succeed and that they can contribute fully to the life of the student body, which is the whole purpose of this. So flexible learning has been a big buzzword in recent years. Yeah. How well is the university living up to their, their goals on flexible learning? Well, we're trying. Uh, I'll, I'll only say that I think as I look across the world, uh, we have a more a conscious program uh, to develop flexible learning opportunities than almost any other institution that I've seen of our scale. Uh, it's hard to do it at, at an institution that has 50,000 students and two campuses, but um, I've been really impressed by the level of commitment that I see amongst so many of our faculty members who actually want to try to, uh, as, as we say, move away from the sage on the stage model. And so um, it, no one knows, frankly, exactly where this is going globally. You know, anyone who pretends to say, I know what a university is going to look like from a teaching and learning perspective 25 years from now, I think is either a fool or lying because there's so much change taking place. I actually look at our position now 
in a way uh, similar to what I think the music industry experienced a decade ago, the book publishing industry has experienced, all of the so-called knowledge-based industries. I don't think of a university as an industry, but we are content and knowledge-based. And because of that, all of the new technologies are going to have, uh, you know, to use an overused term, disruptive effects in the same way that they have in those other spheres. And so what we've tried to do with flexible learning is, again, take an approach where we're piloting various different ways of imagining the future of the relationship between a student, instructor, classroom, peers. And um, I think there are a lot of exciting things being done. We're piloting MOOCs, not so much because we're particularly committed to having hundreds of thousands of people look at UBC MOOCs, but largely because we can use them to learn how better to create materials that can also be used in classroom uh, so that we flip the classroom, pro uh, provide opportunities for more uh, engagement, more dialogue, more debate, more teamwork, all of the things that we know uh, actually help students learn better. So strategic plan place and promise was initiated with you as president. Mm -hmm. How well has the university lived up to those goals? Well, I would say it differs across the different commitments of place and promise. I think that the fundamental goals around student learning, we've done a pretty good job in implementing. I'm not saying things are perfect, always areas for improvement, but I am very proud of the strides that we've made over the course of the last few years. So you talk about the Flexible Learning Initiative. In a sense, that's the most recent iteration. But if you go back right to the beginning of Place and Promise, you'll note that uh, we uh, initiated a lot of changes. For example, in the whole tenure and promotion process, uh, we worked very hard to ensure that teaching and learning would form a more robust part of that process. They were always there, but we're actually trying to treat them very seriously. And we've, I think, had success across the university in making sure that people understand that it isn't only about your research prowess, that you also have to show that you're committed to and successful in teaching. Uh, we also, of course, created, uh, through the Senate, university-wide uh, course evaluations. It amazed me when I arrived here that they didn't exist. They do now exist. Again, they can be made better, but I think that was a, a major achievement. The broad-based admissions piece is also about student uh, learning because what we're hoping to do is create classrooms and dorms that are actually filled with interesting people who want to engage, not only people who happen to have the highest possible grades. You look at uh, the creation of the enrollment services professionals. Uh, that was a dramatic shift for UBC to say, we're gonna try now and have one person connect with a student from the time she arrives until the time she graduates with a kind of one point of service. Uh, mentality. So a lot has happened there. I'm very proud of that. I think on the international front, uh, a lot has happened. Uh, we made commitments around international engagement. So if you, uh, I won't go into all the details, but if you think about where UBC was positioned in relation to its three uh, priority areas, we said we were going to focus on China, on India, and on Europe. Well, I'll take Europe, for example. We've, uh, in recent times, developed a very exciting partnership in quantum materials with the Max Planck Society. They have a center on campus. That's a huge achievement. Only a couple of them exist anywhere in the world. It's because we're so good at it and they wanted to partner with us. The Fraunhofer Society of Germany in clean energy, now located right here on campus. That's a, a hugely important uh, connection. In India, uh, we now lead uh, IC, India Canada, the IMPACTS, which is the largest comprehensive research collaboration that's ever existed between Canada and India, he headed out of UBC. In China, we've created a China Council, drawing together all of our resources uh, to try to ensure that we are doing the very best possible job we can, collect connecting with Chinese institutions, attracting uh, students, of course, from all over the world. So, you know, I could go on, but I think that's an area of strength. Where I think we've been perhaps uh, slower is in two areas. Uh, one is in uh, the commitment around community engagement. 
turned out to be harder for us to get our hands on what was happening across the whole university and figuring out how we were going to drive that uh, more effectively. There is community engagement taking place everywhere, community-based research, uh, student actions all over the city, all over the province and internationally, go global, all of these things are there. I'm not sure that we've yet managed to capture an initiative that, that can really draw together those resources as effectively as we should. We're in the midst of that now. It's just taken longer than I would have hoped. So there is going to be a new uh, community engagement strategy, I hope, finished uh, by the end of this year. The, the other area where I think we still need to do a lot of work is in um, what we call intercultural understanding. Uh, Yes, having lots of international students will help because it diversifies in a dramatic way the campus, but moving from diversity to genuine inclusion is sometimes difficult. So figuring out how to make sure, for example, from a student perspective, that we don't have sort of I'll use a strong term, ghettos, but clumps of students of the same ethnicity who are not really integrating with one another. We know that's still a challenge on the, on the Vancouver campus in particular. Uh, we've got lots of ideas about how to address that. It's taken a little bit longer than I would have liked to really make those ideas come to life. I'll stop there, sorry, I could go on. Broad-based admissions this year, has that had a no noticeable effect on student engagement? Oh, it's a bit early to tell, right? I mean, we're still in the early stages of that. I, I can tell you that I, and, and this is frankly a bit anecdotal, uh, so it's, it's a little hard, but I've talked with quite a number of the residence uh, coordinators and, and people who are in residence life, and uh, I had a, a student group uh, at breakfast uh, just a couple of days ago, and they uh, said to me that they did feel that there was a difference in the kind of people that they were interacting with from a residence perspective. More people wanting to be part of the broader community, fewer people just keeping their head down in the library or the lab in the room. I hope that's true. I think we're only going to know that uh, over you know, the next five, um, probably even ten years as we look at the Nessie scores and all the other objective measures which will tell us whether there are more people who are actively engaged. So uh, what do you plan to focus on your you know, last final months here at, at UBC as well as what sort of legacy do you hope to, to leave behind? Well, I think whatever legacy I leave is probably already left. So uh, I don't think I'm going to try and establish something in the last five months. One of the things I clearly have to focus on because it's very much the role of the president is to uh, get as far ahead as possible in uh, our campaign start an evolution both in terms of alumni engagement and in terms of fundraising so on the alumni engagement front we're doing brilliantly I mean we're almost at the uh, target for the campaign already on the uh, money front uh, we've raised almost 1.3 billion of the 1.5 billion dollar target and we still have you know almost two years to go so we're on the right trajectory I will try to include as many uh, big gifts <laughs> that I'm working on as possible before I leave. The other area where I'm going to continue to focus my energies uh, is in uh, this question of flexible learning. I'm not really the key driver of all of that, but I do want to make sure that I'm doing the very best I can to marshal all of the resources of the university to keep that moving forward, working with the provosts, working with the deans. Lastly, um, I'm going to continue to focus on government relations. Uh, universities had a huge win in the last federal budget. Didn't get very much reporting because the budget was seen as a sort of do-nothing budget. It wasn't from the perspective of universities. $1.5 billion investment in research over the next 15 years, specifically targeted on a program that I and a couple of my colleagues have been advocating for the last two years. I'm thrilled about that. I've got to keep working on that to make sure the implementation is as we hoped it would be. $227 million to support Triumph, uh, the uh, nuclear facility right here on campus, and uh, new money for the granting councils. All of that to say, I've got to keep my eye on on that ball to make sure that that money is uh, spent wisely. I think those are going to be really probably the areas that I'll have to focus on for the next few months. I'm not sure if you know if there's a humor magazine on campus called the, the Syrup Trap. Yes, I'm very familiar with it. They invite <laughs> ask if they come to sleep over at your house. Yes, uh, absolutely. 
<laughs> yeah, um, that would not be very successful. <laughs> Ah, look, it's fun. <laughs> I, I think uh, people should have fun on campus, so I have no, I have no problem with that. Yeah, I think that's we're about out, out of time. Oh, Anything else you want to do? Um, uh, professor Two, uh, this year uh, students voted uh, strongly in favor of divesting from UEC. Right. I'm sorry to prepare this question beforehand, but what is, right. the, what is the kind of state of the board's investigation? Yeah, the board's working very hard on it. Uh, there's actually been a subcommittee of the board on um, whatever you might want to call it, responsible investing, et cetera. And uh, uh, as I understand it, I've actually been away uh, for the last little while in India. Uh, but I think that there's going to be a report presented probably uh, at the next Board of Governors meeting. Uh, and of course, obviously, that will ultimately be very public. And uh, they wanted to reflect on what they thought the committee, the best approach was going to be. So I'm sure there will be a continuing dialogue around that over the next few months. Thanks very much.